Hello, my name is Silke Leimkühler and today my colleague Beatrice Roldan and I are going to introduce you into the research we are conducting at the Cluster of Excellence Uni Suskat, which is coordinated by the Technical University of Berlin. Our research cluster combines um, scientists, including senior and junior scientists, um, which are working at the three universities in Berlin, the University of Potsdam, uh, the Charité, and the research institutes FHI, MPI KG, HZB, and FMP at the uh, Berlin-Brandenburg area. And the research combines uh, highly interdisciplinary research areas, uh, including molecular biology, structural biology, chemistry, physics, uh, and theory. Under the topic Revolutionizing Catalysis, uh, we are going to introduce our Cluster of Excellence Unisys CAT. First, there's going to be an um, introductory lecture by our speaker, Arne Thomas, and uh, he's going to be giving a basic introduction to the research done in this, uh, in this area. Then we are going to have expert talks by several scientists within the cluster. We want to give you the, uh, an idea of the excellent office springs that we have in our cluster. Uh, for example, uh, junior professor Francisca Hess, um, also Tobias Gens and Marius Horg are going to be giving a, um, uh, giving a presentation of their work. Another topic within the Berlin Science Week that uh, we would like to contribute to is uh, to raise awareness about gender issues in science. And in this case, we are going to have expert uh, talks and we are going to have a debate. Um, we have uh, Ines Weidinger, Maria-Andrea Morvinsky, um, Professor Leinkula and myself are going to be uh, talking in this area, in particular, how, what was our pathway to become a professor. And uh, at the end, uh, we are going to have uh, also an interview and, and some uh, discussion about uh, an, uh, our topic of research. In this case, how to go from uh, carbon dioxide to the production that is a greenhouse house, to the greenhouse gas, to the production of chemicals and fuels. Yeah, so I'm a biologist, a biochemist, and uh, our research uh, is conducted with enzymes. Enzymes are proteins which are composed of 21 amino acids, and we are trying to use these enzymes to fix CO2 and to produce some uh, yeah, usable fuels, what we call it, to convert them to compounds which then can be used as an energy source. This concept exists in nature already. Um, I guess everyone knows about photosynthesis, which enables life on Earth, and photosynthesis, carbon dioxide, is fixed um, then to produce oxygen and um, sugar compounds. Uh, but we are now trying to use this concept um, in a smaller scale and to use these enzymes then to fix CO2. So I'm, I'm working in the electrochemical conversion of uh, carbon dioxide to chemicals and fuels. And the, the idea is that both of, have, both of us have the same goal. We want to, to take a greenhouse gas and convert it into something useful. Um, he, her approach is based on biological materials. My approach is based on, uh, on inorganic materials. But we all both to do artificial photosynthesis. We both want to close the, the, the carbon cycle and be able to, so we know very well how to take hydrocarbons and fuels and burn them and to make CO2. What we need to learn now is how to take this CO2 and convert it back to something useful. In this case, in my research, we are trying to make hydrocarbons and fuels, for example, ethanol or ethylene. Ethylene is being used to make polymers, to make, for example, a packaging. And ethanol is used as a source of energy. Okay, so chemically CO2 is quite a stable compound, it's inert, how we call it, and it is, requires a lot of energy input to convert it then to other compounds which we then can use as fuel. In biology, the nature has used, I mean, during evolution, has optimized systems, and so in biology, CO2 can be fixed um, under ambient temperature, and in cells then uh, with the usage of the, the energy provided by the cell and produced by the cell. 
So in the case of um, electrochemical CO2 conversion, what we are trying to do is to use uh, renewable energy, in this case, for example, so solar energy or wind energy, as an energy source to produce electricity. Uh, to make this process uh, actually interesting for an, at, at the industrial level, we should have cheap electricity, and this has been achieved in the, in the recent years. The whole process requires the energy, as uh, in this case solar or wind energy, as a source. We want to go from carbon dioxide to products that are going to be of industrial value, for example, making ethanol or making hydrocarbons, and uh, we are going to use inorganic materials. Maybe the, the advantage of inorganic materials versus some of the biological materials could be that they are more stable and uh, it's possible also to regenerate them at the industrial setting on site. And uh, stability is one of the key problems in catalysis, selectivity and stability. But I believe that both of our projects are very complementary because in both cases I'm, I'm trying also to learn what nature does because nature is already doing photosynthesis for many, many years. And uh, right now we are trying to develop catalysts that are going to be doing what the photosynthesis uh, catalysts in nature are doing. So in um, electrochemical uh, CO2 reduction, the idea is, for example, at the moment we are producing a lot of energy, electrical energy, through renewable energy. But this energy is uh, intermittent. So you, can, you are not uh, able to use it uh, when, when it's produced. And it's not always being produced as much as we need, and sometimes we have excess. If you are able to take this energy and on site, use it for, an, for another process, in this case, to drive an electrochemical process, this electricity is basically used as the energy source to convert CO2, this very stable molecule, into something useful. And uh, the energy that we have at the moment is uh, renewable energy. Then you can have a, a, a process that will be uh, zero carbon uh, process. So you can go from CO2 without producing more CO2 into something valuable. Uh, I mean, the answer is yes, we, we think so, because um, that's why we are working on this. Uh, but it is, of course, challenging, and, uh, but there are first examples already provided by nature on a biotechnolo biotechnology level. Um, there are organisms which can fix uh, CO2 to acetate uh, without using the sunlight, so in a non-photosynthetic process. Um, and even they can um, then convert the CO2 not only um, to acetate but also to methanol. And first companies are using this process. It's not so efficient, um, but I mean in our research we are trying uh, not to use the whole uh, and our whole cell system. We are trying to use enzymes. Uh, we want to stabilize the enzymes and then to make them efficient um, that uh, CO2 can be fixed into um, other organic compounds. Yeah, so we are using enzymes uh, which exist already in the cell, which were evolved um, um, by nature. But the enzymes we are using so far are not um, working in the direction of CO2 reduction, of CO2 fixation. They are doing the opposite um, reaction. Um, they produce CO2 from formate. So the enzymes we are working with are called formate dehydrogenases. And in our work, we would like to engineer them in a way that they do the reverse reaction that they do, as I said, CO2 reduction. Uh, it is working already, um, so enzymes exist. So we are just trying to make this uh, reaction more efficient at the moment. Um, CO2 is converted into methanol, for example, uh, through a hydrogenation process. In this case, normally they are using hydrogen that is not green hydrogen, it's uh, hydrogen, they call it blue, so it's, it's produced based on fossil fuels. And uh, this process is very, um, requires a lot of energy. Um, it happens at high pressure and uh, about 250, 300 Celsius. The idea of now finding an alternative process, in this case, the electrochemical conversion of CO2. So now we don't need to apply high pressure. We can do this, re this reaction at atmospheric pressure. We can do it uh, in water. And the only thing that we need is to have electricity. For many years, electricity was expensive, so this process was not industrially viable. But now, through the use of renewable energy, through the, the possibility of employing excess solar or wind energy that we will have, 
we are gonna be able to take CO2 and uh, convert this molecule into other high value products, for example, making hydrocarbons such as ethylene or making uh, fuels such as ethanol. So I think um, um, the electrochemical production of either hydrogen or going from CO2 to hydrocarbons and fuels, these are very complementary processes. It's not one or the other. It's very important that we work towards both processes. The beauty of this is that we can uh, work uh, in, in a complementary way, so you can develop the same uh, electrochemical cells, the same electrolyzers for both processes, so all the engineering, all of this development will be the same. When you want to use hydrogen as a fuel, I think this is um, a very important process. My research group is also working on this, but I see this more a little bit long term. The CO2 electrochemical reduction can be done in a smaller scale and can be done on site. For example, we have a lot of industry that is already producing CO2 at the moment in a highly concentrated manner. And without changing any of the infrastructure, we could start with a small scale CO2 electrolyzers to take this concentrated CO2 on site and convert it into, for example, a fuel like ethanol or ethylene. This doesn't mean that we shouldn't be doing electrolysis from water to hydrogen. We need to do that too. But there we might need to have a little bit more infrastructural changes. And I think if we work with both processes in parallel, we can take advantage of everything that we learn in terms of electrolyzer technology that we are developing for hydrogen economy as well as to convert uh, the, the greenhouse gas CO2 into something valuable. We can combine all of this knowledge. So I believe we need to do both and they have very different, uh, very different applications. So if we can do things on site where we are producing the CO2, this is going to be marketable. And uh, there are a number of industries in Germany that are already going towards this goal for CO2 electrochemical conversion. And I think it will be short term versus the hydrogen that we need a little bit more major infrastructural changes. The next level is maybe to go to more complex systems. Uh, so one goal in our research project is to then couple different enzymes to use um, hydrogen as energy source and to couple the hydrogenase with our format dehydrogenase uh, or to couple photosystem which is performing, I mean which is using the energy from the sunlight and that then as an energy source for the CO2 reduction process. A very important challenge is that in both cases we need water for the electrolyte. And a very important challenge is how to get water that is clean enough. Um, when we are doing uh, uh, water splitting for hydrogen production, ideally you want to do this with uh, water from the ocean because this is readily available. And in many of the processes that we are, we are working with, the main challenge is that we need to have water that will be a good electrolyte. And uh, most of the water is too dirty to be able to, to be used as, as it is. The, the type of the, an electrochemical process uh, has different steps. First of all, you need to have this, your source, in this case will be CO2, and it's very challenging to get CO2 from the atmosphere and concentrate it. It's possible to do it, but it's expensive. So the first applications that we are going to see is when we are, have, for example, a, a cement plant where we already have very large amounts of CO2 concentrated on site. We don't need to spend any, any energy to, to, to concentrate it. And so this is going to be our source of CO2. This is also in mills and, and in, in many of the industrial processes that we have currently. Then the, the second step, we need ener energy. And the energy here, we are working at atmospheric pressure, but we need energy in terms of electricity. So we need to be able to, to have access, in this case, to clean energy, renewable energy. So we need uh, low solar or, or wind energy. Then we need to have an electrolyzer. So the technology, the, 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 the reactor, the device for the electrolysis is actually not very complex. But we know, we, need very, we know right now very well how to do this at the lab scale. But if we want to scale this up, we need to develop also this technology. So we have a problem of scaling up what we know very well how to do in the lab. So this will be the reactor. And then at the core is the catalyst. So we need to develop very active selective catalysts that are simple to synthesize so that this will be of industrial relevance. If we need 100 steps to synthesize the catalyst, no industry is going to be able to follow this process. So we need a catalyst that is going to be 
made out of earth abundant materials. We need a catalyst that is going to be simple to make. It will be low cost and ideally you, you should be able to regenerate it. Yes. So with the enzyme systems, we will try to fix uh, the CO2 from the atmosphere to produce a compound that can be then used as a fuel uh, and then again emit um, CO2 to the atmosphere. But this is a closed cycle, so we will not uh, then produce more CO2. So in the long term range, uh, the global CO2 uh, concentration will be reduced, um, so enzyme systems will contribute to that, uh, but not, uh, as I said, only in the long-term range, uh, and it's in a closed cycle. I think the, the idea that we have, we will be really happy if we can stop the, the very rapid increase in the, in the Earth temperature. So we have a goal of staying below two degrees increase, and I think uh, there is already very clear scientific evidence that the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere has a correlation with the increase in the temperature of our planet. So this is already a given. Now, anything that we can do to, to minimize this is something that scientists, we have this, this uh, very important task for the next generation. Um, there are different aspects that we can address. One, of, one aspect is uh, we can address through trying to minimize CO2 emissions, for example, going to processes, as we mentioned before, um, changing the, the energy to, to sources that will be such as hydrogen, and so something that is not going to be involved fossil fuels. This is one aspect. The other aspect is we cannot uh, stop all the industrial work that we have right now, and especially we don't need to think only about the developed countries. We need to think also about the uh, underdeveloped countries, where you cannot say, stop completely your industry, and, and we will give you at some point a technology to make hydrogen. So given that we also have this problematic, we need to have alternatives. And uh, the idea of on-site being able to convert the CO2 that we are producing, and that we will be producing still for a number of years, electrochemically into something useful that can be used also on site, I think this is a very attractive idea. I don't believe that this is going to solve our climate change problem. I believe that our solution is really go to, going towards a hydrogen economy. But I think it's not one or the other, it's one and the other. And we need to think about short term, what we can do right now, and there are already industries doing this. You are, they are already trying to, have, to make use of this concentrated CO2. And there are different processes. You can do it electrochemically but you also can do it through thermal catalysis. In my group, we are working on both aspects. And at some point, there are gonna be a mix of thermal catalysis processes and electrochemical processes. And ideally, it will be something that you can switch from one to the other. For example, if electricity becomes more expensive, then it may be more interesting to do a thermal catalysis process, even if you have to use more energy in terms of high pressure. And when the electricity prices are low, then you will switch to the production of a certain chemical based on an electrochemical process. And uh, I think catalysis is at the core of everything that we have in our daily life. So if you think about it, most of the products that you're using daily, at some point a catalyst was used. And, and whether you are, you are doing this uh, through thermal catalysis, through electrochemistry, through biological catalysis, I think this is something that is, is really, really very important for the development of our society. So in, in the field of CO2 electro reduction, there is a very strong link now to biology. There are already a number of research groups and even industry interested in using algae, for example, uh, as, as a catalyst. And so there is a, very, a lot of interest in combining also organic and inorganic uh, systems and using also things that nature gives us as an elect, uh, electrocatalyst. So I believe that there is a, lo a lot of synergy between these aspects of, of catalysis. I studied biology and the other level, I mean, uh, of um, f a, a woman during the studies was much more than, than men. I think it was above 50%. Um, but it leveled out a little bit later then. Uh, at the moment, I think my, at my university in Potsdam, um, I'm at the biochemistry and biology department. We have 40% female professors, so the university is doing a good job in hiring women. So when I, when I started my career in Spain, there was not a big difference between number of uh, female studying uh, in physics. Uh, it was 60% male, 40% female. But this changed when I moved to the US and this has dramatically changed when I moved to Germany. So I was the only female professor in the physics department at the Ruhr University Bochum. 
uh, when I joined and then uh, when, I, when I became a director at the Free Sava Institute, I was the first female director in the history. So this is over 100 years. So there is, uh, it is a big change. I don't see a difference between female and male scientists in terms of, you know, I always talk to colleagues and it doesn't matter what type of colleague I'm talking to, but uh, it is at times difficult to, to convey the idea to, of, of the younger generation that there are certain jobs that are not more male oriented or more female oriented. When, when you start talking to little girls and, and, and little boys, I think it should be very natural to become a scientist. And it shouldn't matter what gender you are if you want to become a scientist. Mm -hmm.